they have or their work has uh, benefited all of us. Yes, so, uh, okay, can I invite the grand jury a little later? Yeah, okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Diana is asking, there is a small group of, uh, another panel we have selected, who are going to ask them questions once I am through. So, <laughs> I want to make sure that I am through first. Okay, so, can you also come over and join the people who are, well, come over and if you want to, yeah. Richard and uh, Suji, yes. Nobody can say I didn't remember. <laughs> Richard. Very good. Great. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you already heard Nathan, and uh, therefore I'm not going uh, to add to that, but you have here uh, two persons, many of you have known, like I have, both of them, but still I would like to say just a few sentences here. Uh, uh, Hung Wei, she is well known to most of us over here, 11 years of public service and uh, what, 20 plus years of volunteer work, right? You want to say uh, just a few words about yourself, just to Skype? Sure. Um, I'm Hung Wei. I have lived in Cupertino since uh, 20, uh, actually 1990. And I have been a Fremont Union High School District Board member for 11 years. I just retired December last year. And I love my community. So um, I dubbed myself professional volunteer. And, and, and I believe there are lots of hidden treasures in our society. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Anthony, sir. Yes, he is a magician, and I'm going to tell you why. But, but Anthony, he is 25 plus years of community service, and uh, I just can't add more to it. Go ahead. I don't know if I can live up to this. So I have a disclaimer. It's only because there's an empty seat, they need to fill it up. So <laughs> I'll be the substitute. Uh, in fact, I, I feel very humble sitting next to all these leaders. I'm nothing about heroes or hidden treasure, but it's only a human being that I see so many love around, and, and I would like to uh, do likewise. Uh, by trade, I was trained as a classical composer. I conduct, um, and I do a lot of arts and culture, non for non-profit management, but also my other hobby, uh, I did 18 years on youth development, particularly to new immigrants, children, um, when I was in East Coast. Wow, <coughs> there's more to add to that, I'm sure about that, and we'll get to that. So gentlemen, what I and we all of us actually will be talking about is the extension of what you heard social responsibility, and how can each one of us be everyday heroes? Okay. So uh, to get to that, Hung, I want to first give you a chance to, um, you know, I noticed uh, that your education uh, is around languages and literature. And uh, naturally, one of your hobbies is reading. Absolutely. Yes. So I want to ask, uh, which author has captivated you, impressed you, influenced you, and inspired you most? And why? OK, um, I can think of um, my major was in foreign languages, literature. Foreign means mostly English. And, and that um, was in American Taiwan. American right? English when I was in Taiwan. And yeah. I came to the UCLA, I studied linguistics. So you're right, language and literature uh, are my uh, favorite. And I d did read a lot of books, you know. You all know about Mark Twain, Shakespeare, and um, Little Women's uh, author Louisa Alcott. Alcott. You know, they're all great authors, and they all can tell stories, ordinary people's stories, and uh, find hidden treasures in them. You know, about love, about friendship, courage, and curiosity. But actually, my most favorite authors, most people cannot name, I cannot name them. I believe 
you know, people who write children's stories are the most imaginative and most um, you know, picturesque authors that really tell about ordinary people with hidden treasures because you have to tell children about children's stories and in simplistic forms and but all have a lesson. If you read a lot of uh, children's literature, there is or a few lessons in every book they, they write. They, it, the books teach children honesty, courage, friendship, and uh, even patriotism. So I believe my admiration goes to all the children's book authors. Very well said, yeah. We all are affected by that, and we all remember exactly what happens early on. So, um, Anthony, since I have known you, I have always admired you. Your articulation and the clarity of your purpose, and I'm really meaning it. So, we are definitely privileged to have him over here. Those of you you don't know, you will get to see him more. Tell us something that even Google hasn't discovered yet about you. Uh -oh. Well, uh, I have to confess, um, music was my first love and still do. I just don't tell my wife. <laughs> so <laughs> help me to keep that one. Um, another is um, I like to do community development holistic community development in a third country. Um, it was uh, during what they call the um, midlife crisis. I want to find meaning uh, in, in my career. In an ex accident, um, also a very o uh, like occasion that I follow one of my mentor uh, to visit uh, some places that really uh, reach my heart and I can see that I can also be an engineer even though I was trained as a, a composer, a social engineer. Uh, what I learned helped me to see the dots, put the needs, link them together, then will become something that we're all happy and proud of. Uh, so I'll give you a short story in two minutes. Please. Right. Um, it was five or six years ago. Uh, I was called to do an assessment, um, what, what you call those uh, uh, business report to analyze where are the bottleneck. And I was being thrown to the northern uh, Thailand, up in the mountain, somebody called that Golden Triangle. I said, what do you want me to see? They said, uh, we have a, a stuck business, can't go anywhere. Can you tell us where you can improve it? Which is one of my, my background is to find a bottleneck, improve the operation. So they took me up to the mountain, spent three days uh, on a four wheel drive and then on an elephant back because the road is so bad. I sleeping on the floor and in the wheel, the whole, uh, they call it a tribal development uh, um, operation there. It is about farmers. It is about transformation of life. So what they tell me is like, there were a group of people that were not hidden treasure, but hidden from the government. Nobody knows them. They know identity. Uh, Chinese, Cambodian, Thai, uh, and hill tribes. I said, why they have to live up there? They were farmers, organic farmers, but they were farming opium under the threat by the, the drug cartel. And they asked me, can you transform this? I said, what do you want me to do? Oh, job training. So my job is to turn the opium farmer into productive normal ones. I couldn't do this until I met a friend who is a, 
are experts in soil and in agriculture. They told me, once you grow opium, the soil is so acidic, you practically cannot grow anything except coffee beans. Oh, wow. <laughs> but the moisture and sun we bring in the seed, they can grow coffee beans. So I have a tools to train the opium farmer into organic farming coffee bean. The next step, we have to build the brewing company, help them to do so we create jobs for the kids and for the women. The third thing, which is my last tears, I have to knock on the door and lay out the distribution line, which if you know Thailand, people will laugh at you that they only drink tea, they don't drink coffee. Yeah. But you know what? There's Starbucks in Asia. <laughs> so I knock on Starbucks CEO's door. I want you to try this coffee, and if it is good, can you consider? <laughs> and he drank it, and it's very impressive. Then. He was skeptical, so we flew 10 different samples to Seattle, have a lab to test. And nine out of 10 passed that gourmet uh, uh, quality. Immediately, they come back and, uh, and, and tell me, I want them, I want them all. How much you could grow a year? So I asked, about four to five ton. No, he said, even one store, we need nine ton a year. So okay. We'll do it, just so they get the money, get the contract, and start. So from 25 village, now it's over 200. Self-sustainable. Did, did I say that he's a magician, and that is the reason? I'm I only laying the dots, yeah. and it happened <laughs> on itself. Many of us can do that, all the dots are there, so that is certainly admirable. Yes, no, that's okay. That's okay. So I come to Nathan. By the way, I'm going to expand on that a little bit uh, in the second round. So Nathan, I have known you for quite some time. And uh, as Vandana mentioned, we had an opportunity to go with Nathan in one of the homeless shelters and cook uh, meals for them. Actually, a few times we have done that. And thank you so much for that opportunity. Well, thanks for your support. Really. And uh, you know, you have definitely made an impact in helping the most vulnerable uh, strata of our society. These are the people they need the most help, as a matter of fact. It is hard for them to themselves leap out of that situation. So it requires compassion, commitment, and collaboration. So my question to you is, what is your inspiration? Is there any leader you can point to that he has, while growing up or over here or wherever in my life, I drew inspiration from this person. Of course, definitely everyone uh, look up to someone, the leader. Before I talk about leader, I would say it's my, you know, Sadhguru Shirdi Sai Baba. Oh, I he is my. I am an ardent devotee of Shirdi Sai Baba. Okay. He always said, uh, "Feed the hungry." If you want to that's see true. me, feed the hungry. Yes, that's what he did in his lifetime. So that's where we started, and you know, I always um, you know followed Baba and what he has done. Stay humble, surrender your ego to his feet, and uh, do the service. Simple. But as we grow, and uh, my role model, I would say, um, I, I'm a role model of uh, Mother Teresa. Always. Oh, Even my signature yeah. says, "If you can't feed 100 people, just feed one." Correct. So even in our the video we shown, it's not how much we show love, how much we put love into it. Yeah. So it's, it's all Mother Teresa. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I admire that. I mean, I have been in India uh, after coming over here 35, 40 years back. I, every year I've gone back, but, and I've gone to Calcutta, but I never could find time to visit Mother Teresa's uh, uh, ashram. But last time, Vandana and I made it a point to go and see that, and believe me, we came out different. It, it, is, it certainly... It does to you. This size room, she lived in that small room all his life, all her life. Yes. So I thank you so much. I I come back to you, Hong.
just one more question in the grand jury my please be ready you know after this you must have had some questions now after hearing about who these folks are so uh Hung, i want to know uh that during all this public service so much of volunteer work tell me about that one achievement that you are very proud of um anthony i am I admire you, you uh, do a lot of youth service. And I love teenagers. When people say that I love teenagers and they think I'm crazy, but teenagers are so vulnerable. And I, when I was an uh, advisor for a newsletter for Mount Vista High School for, with the DERA, uh, I have yes. about um, 10 to 15 staff that students meet in my house every um, couple months, uh, twice a month. And I told them, let's share you know, share your headaches, your heartaches, and whatever set in my living room stayed in my living room. And um, I told them, you're always welcome to come back anytime to my place. So one day, I was like, after midnight, there was somebody knocking on my door. And I opened the door, it was this young student from my group, and she said, can I stay with you for the night? I said, you could, but I got to let your parents know. So. I, I think one thing that I was very proud of is, is to make connections between the teenager and their parents. You know, how much she was disappointed, in, but how much he's, her parents really love, love, love her. So the next day, I talked to her dad, and, then, um, and I was very proud they could um, make up and understand each other. But the other thing, the other thing I was very proud of was my other Vodadera staff. Actually, they heard about her walking out the home, and two of them told me, we knew she came to you. Well, they did not know, but they said, we thought she came to you, and because we know we could trust you, and, and you'll help us anytime. So I'm hoping that they understand that uh, what I said is true, that I, my door's always open. And, and then, then actually, uh, a couple of years ago, um, a, a young lady emailed me, and, but I did tell them, if I don't remember your name, excuse my old age. You know, it's 10 years over there, are many teenagers come, to, come through my house. I don't remember each one of them, but I said, if your family move away, you want to come back, visit your friends or family, you can always welcome stay with me. And she did, she said, did you remember me? I said, well, in line to my memory, which year, and then she stayed with me for a few days to, to visit her friends here because her parents uh, moved away. And so I am... I'm hoping if any one of them is watching this, they know that I, I truly mean that they can always come back to me and I will always listen to them yeah, and always be, uh, um, just to be there for them. And I think everybody needs that. Everybody needs to someone that um, they know that they, I won't ask questions and that I would just uh, give them a hug, said um, everything's gonna be fine. That, that, is, that is one quality of the leadership, that to establish that trust and that is what what you demonstrated is that result of that trust that you were able to step congratulations that's great by the way when anthony was talking about that transforming opium for farms into coffee growing farms um there was one aspect and i i, I believe that i'm sure you must have uh, made uh, impact on that i have heard that you are very good. You are an specialist. You are an expert in fundraising. Now, most of us over here, in one way or the other, we are involved with an activity where we, required, we are required to raise funds for our community service or whatever, whatnot, whatever we have. And here is a guru. So I want to ask him, can you tell us about that one important thing, most important thing that we should look for when we are uh, going out for raising fund for our, funds for our cause. Okay, another disclaimer. <laughs> uh, my fundraiser, so I can, I can flip this. I'm the big backer. Uh, I'm a convinced backer. Um, well, just a joke. In, in fact, fundraising is all about relationship building. People a lot of time thought that people give money to cause or mission, but a lot of time it is they give because the person, 
that they trust, that they interact with, and they 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 feel that if he or she support this, it must be good. So I'm going to support this. And to be a key fundraiser, you need to find that key and unlock that relationship. The rest of them is building up that relationship. Beautiful. That's again comes down to trust and the relationship. Absolutely great. Yes. Nathan. In your uh, uh, description, when you're uh, talking about community seva, you kind of quickly, uh, as a matter of fact, in the video, you showed that kitchen. And, uh, you know, we, when we, were, uh, we went out to cook meals for homeless, we had to go to this shelter and use their kitchen to do that. So we were bound by certain times and certain other restrictions we had, so we didn't have that kind of flexibility. This thing, having your own kitchen must have really helped you a lot in that. So why don't you take a few minutes, a couple of minutes, and tell how did you get about that, how it has helped. And also, I've heard that you are, you talked about hygiene kits, but you are also doing some portable showers, right? Right. And this is a full service, as a matter of fact, for homeless people, I mean, to keep them healthy, food, and the cleanliness, hygiene, and lightness. Sure. Um, when we started, you know, from where we started from giving sandwiches as a family and then to pizza and then to the shelter, as you rightly pointed out, the youth, they are unable to come because there is an age restriction by the shelter that 18 and above only can come. So we are also, there are several, you know, senior citizens, low income families, they are not being touched upon because we are only serving to those people who are in the shelter. Santa Clara County has around 7,700 homeless people. Only 1,300 is on the shelter. Rather, 5,000 are on the street. So now we wanted to do more. And this kitchen idea has been actually been on our thoughts. But again, I'm touching upon the children. Once um, we went to a shelter where we serve underprivileged families. And when we, there's one of the kitchen, um, is the stove was not working. So we went to go and look at that to see whether we wanted to cook for more people, whether it will accommodate, whether we can cook for 100 people or only 40. So we went to see that. While we were walking in, you saw those red shirts, right? We were wearing the shirts. We served in another shelter and we were walking inside. A few bunch of kids came behind us. Oh, you got food for us? You got food for us. But you know what? We weren't. Because we weren't not planning to cook in that shelter. We just came to serve. That thought that day, that spark triggered. It's really we need to have a kitchen where we can go and cook at our own convenient times. And the youth. And that's when it, is, it wasn't easy. 13 months of uh, hard work. Uh, walked around uh, myself and also I want to introduce our executive director, Saras, who is sitting here with us. We walked around um, several community centers and you know, many people say it's you know, tough to work with city, but I say no. It was, they were beautiful, wonderful people. Um, the cause was touching them, and you know, we worked together 13 months, and you know, we finally found a kitchen which is uh, not been used. It was actually made for senior serving senior citizens, but some of the program didn't kick off. The door was just waiting for us to come in. So we just last June we inaugurated that. Now. At a one go, we can cook for 200 people. So we are opening every weekend. So close to around 1,000 people, additional meal we are able to cook. Now Sunnyvale is open, Sunnyvale Shelter is open throughout the year. And um, uh, Gilroy, all open for extra in the winter hours. So we are able to um, accommodate more people. You know, that's one, it's a great blessing for us to have that kitchen. And shower is another blessing, which has been another my dream. Um, I'm very fortunate. Uh, to have a wonderful community support, my volunteer group, who's really helping me to achieve my dream. I'm a very selfish guy. So um, this shower is another thing. If you see our community say our tagline, feeding the hungry and serving the homeless. It's been five years we have been our, put our foot firm on the ground in cooking um, and going and you know, uh, serving in the shelter and now kitchen. So we thought now I should slowly shift the focus on to serving the homeless which we do uh, in a smaller way of giving backpacks, blankets, and all those things. But 
many a time we see, you know, we also empower children who make hygiene kits for their birthdays. Uh, toothbrush, paste, shampoo, uh, you know, uh, body lotion and all those things. Now that, where that is getting used. So many homeless people we see, they, they get someone, someone, somehow they feed them. But who is giving them a shower? Yeah. It's very important that we need to give them an opportunity to take shower. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I should have, when Julia asked me, I should have bought a video of a person who has not taken shower for six weeks. Just imagine. Six hours itself is difficult, six days, forget it. Six weeks. Mm -hmm. And um, he was standing in line for shower uh, with a folded hands like this. So I went to him, said, you want to take shower? I said, yes. Mm -hmm. Two minutes later, again I went to him, he said, yes. And third time he was a little agitated, he said, can I take shower or is it okay? Mm -hmm. What it was going in my mind was, this guy doesn't even have a towel. <laughs> He's just standing there. And then I told him, give me a minute, I'll get a backpack. I gave him a backpack. He was so happy because there is a towel and gave a change of shirt. And uh, we have a socks, gloves, beanie. <laughs> Everything is in the back. Okay. And you know the smile, the happiness, and the guy comes with uh, wet air and he's just, you know, uh, wiping his head. <laughs> I asked him, how do you feel it? He said, I feel very good. <laughs> you know, and, he's, and when we Plus go and do this yeah. service... It's not, you know, everyone you take shower, you feel hungry, right? Mm -hmm. So our volunteers, it's a matter of fact, tomorrow morning, if anyone want to come and see 4th Street, North 4th Street on downtown San Jose, I will be there. So we'll be giving shower from 8 to 12. And uh, we also serve hot breakfast. Yeah. When we give, we are actually, we will be cooking and serving in another shelter and we take, we make burritos. <laughs> you know, every time when we go and serve, I guess, as I said earlier, we don't just serve what they like also, right? We want to... Give them whatever, you know, they like it in the sense we used to give, you know, we give a delicious breakfast, uh, pancakes, sausage links, um, put baked potatoes and uh, scrambled egg. But at shower, it was not a best meal because it was on the street. So we asked one person, why don't you get me breakfast burritos? Our, our volunteers immediately jumped on that. And in the last three months, we have been giving burritos. Wow. They love it. <laughs> the churros are on, the, on that pudding and the yeah. burritos. Yeah. So, you know, as I said, it's, it's more than a full-fledged service. It's what a human being needs. That's it's true. not That's about true. food. Yeah. Give them a shower. Mm -hmm. And add to that, there are, we also laundry their clothes. Wow. So there is a laundry, four laundry, three laundry you know, washers and dryer. Mm -hmm. So we have a bag. So they just put the clothes, laundry, and then they can go take shower and the clothes are ready. So... You know, we serve with dignity and smile. That's one yes. of the reasons we thought about this, not just to... We don't want to be labeled the community service as just feeding the homeless people. We yeah. also serve the homeless people. The amount of blessings you're getting, believe me. It's a blessing to... Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, yeah. now, you have heard them talk about what inspires them, where they come from, and what value they added to the community, how everybody else around them has benefited because of their dedication and selfless service. Shoot your questions. Um, hello, Mr. Wei Hong. Yeah. So we meet uh, several times. Uh, yeah. I know you, you're a uh, yeah, very good uh, social worker. And uh, yeah, so last year I attended uh, your event for the Cupertino uh, Council member. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I learned a lot from you. I know you uh, love students, help students, also yeah, love the community. Um, in last year event, uh, yeah, so you have chance to win yeah the seat of the Cupertino yeah council member, but uh, finally yeah didn't get it. So I want to know whether you have any plan in the future election, so yeah you can serve the community, get the community better. Thank you. Elected official. Well, um, I don't think we need to be a public official to make a difference in the community. Actually, I always say any public official just has to be elected to volunteer. It really is a volunteer position. And I, um, I'm immersing myself in a lot of um, activities. And uh, I truly believe everyone here is a hidden treasure for somebody else. You know, along the way, you make a difference in somebody's life. You plant good seeds. 
I'm going to share with you a Rotary story. We got some Rotarians here. Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> you're not listening. I can, you know, um, I encourage every adult to join community service. Could be a church, could be Lions. I happen to join Rotary. And, um, you know, the moment I heard my Rotary store moments, I'm going to share one of them. One of our Rotarian friends went up and said, he grew up in a broken family and he always lacking things. You know, he went to school, he didn't have clothes, you know, with books, backpacks, but always those things show up in his life. Somebody, he, does, he just, I didn't know who, gave me clothes, gave me backpacks, gave me books, gave me pencils. Now um, in adulthood, he is a very successful person. He made a lot of money and he joined Roadhood to give back. He said, I want to be that invisible person that gives back to somebody that um, even though they don't know who gave it to them, but it's going to affect their life. It's going to be make them a better person and make them life easier. So I, I want to share with everybody, this is what everyone can do. You don't have to be in Rotary to do it. You don't have to be uh, in Lions to do it. You make a difference in somebody's life. And I always tell teachers, you know, a school board for 11 years, we meet a lot of teachers. I told them, teenagers are very heartless. They actually appreciate you, but they never tell you. They uh, learn from you, and um, they never tell you. They go back to college, they go out to college, have their life, they don't come back to say, Mrs. So-and-so, you made a difference in my life. Uh, you forgave me, and you taught me this, you gave me a hug. But just know that in a teacher's life, you plant so many seeds in children's lives and you make a difference. You don't have to know, but you know. You don't have to know what really happens. And life will be great if it's like a movie. You know, you can play back. You gave this child something and all of a sudden, 20 years later, this child became a CEO or maybe he or she become a president of the United States of America and she or he remembers you. But they'll never come back to tell you because they're going out there to explore their life, and that is okay. And I believe every one of us has that ability. Every one of us has that influence and can make a difference. So I don't need to be a council member to make a difference, but I would like to be a council member in order to make a difference and uh, make a bigger impact. You know, as a public official, you can make a bigger impact. Bigger impact so yeah. um, I believe everyone is a yeah. council member or a school board member in his, his or own her sure. status. Yeah. Yeah. Different, different forums, yeah. Arlen, you have a question? Yes, let's, uh, I'll go last. Okay, so I asked very simple questions based on what you've, share, what you've all shared. And I was wondering, um, you love uh, literature, and do you think like children's books can influence children to become better, to become <laughs> better leaders or a part of the community? And what would you put in this children's book to help, to help ch influence kids to be community members? I think everybody can, uh, we can let everybody answer. I'm going to give you a very simple answer. Everything we do, everything we read, is a little accumulation of who we become in, in life. And I'm going to tell you one thing. When I was growing up in Taiwan, and I learned English by watching Combat, you know the series? Um, Three's, um, um, the, the Brady Bunch, um, Simon Templar, you know, and... Uh, Sky, uh, the sky. Uh, anyway, I last, I, 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 I would watch every episode, and you know what? Every episode had a lesson. It's all about the lessons that I learned. So of course, I learned English from it too. I should not read the Chinese t subtitle, but I believe in our life, our life is accumulated. Children's books teach them something. And don't think that what you do, your children don't notice. My sons are grown up. They are what I call IPO. They're income producing offsprings. They're married and um, they have women to take care of them. But one time my younger son came back and he said, mom, you know, you and I, he's a social worker in New York. And you and I are born to help others. I said, how do you know that? You know, he, was, he just went to college and came back and, and was the PTA president and I was volunteering. And, and, but he was a teenager, right? And you know, what do you think? Teenagers know this, what you do. He said, Mom, don't you think I have eyes and ears? I, and I, I watch what you do and I'm like, oh my God. So I told all the parents, your kids actually watch you. They, they hear you. And then whatever you do, they learn from around them. So immerse them in good environment. That's when we have great kids. I 
you know, people always say, you say, we want to save the earth for our next generations, right? We want a clean environment. What are we going to give our earth? We want to give good, dedicated, kind-hearted next generation to our earth. And that's so education is so important. I'm going to put it, advocate for education. Everything we do, every book they read, every people they meet, every hug they have, I think shape them into who they are and what they'll become. Oh, um, I just want to thank you because all these leaders redefine what civic leadership means. Most of the people saw this, they immediately thought about the president, the congressman, the senator, politician. But what they put out civic leadership is about your beyond self, the love and care that you for others. And you put this in action, that's all. So, and, and I vivid when you ask that line, Gandhi ever say, be the change you want to see change in this world. So if you remember this, you all can be the civic leader in your own way, no matter how small or how big, in your own unique way. You don't need to compare, but I believe God create everyone has a unique purpose. You just need to find it. You know, I echo both of you said, and you know, these youth are tomorrow's leaders and tomorrow's future. And for them to be a shining example and for them to be a future leader, I truly believe that we need to set ourselves a train, you know, example to them. And before Community Seva was born, everybody wanted to really do something good and help, but they didn't know how to do that. So we, you know, the Community Seva laid the foundation. And today, those volunteers, if you see their kids, everybody is involved. My kids are involved, Sarah's daughter and son are involved. You know, we are laying the foundation for our kids that, you know, you, can, you should give back. And they can choose anywhere they want. It could be, you know, um, books or wherever they could choose. But we must take the responsibilities. Our social responsibility is to set an ex example and lay the foundation for our future generation. Great. Well said. Yep. Alex. <laughs> Hi. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I have a question. So um, I think a big problem for like my generation is that like you guys said, um, we should be active um, participants in our communities. But one problem is that a lot of us are like engrossed in our own lives and we have a hard time seeing like the world for what it is and like um, reaching out and like opening our hearts. So like what advice would you give to our generation to like really search in themselves and find out like how they want to benefit the community and their drive? I, I want to try this because this is always my opening line. If you're not at the table, you will be on the menu. And a lot of us have been on the menu for so long. Although nowadays some of us have a seat but we're still ordering the menu from somebody else. So what I want you to remember first, you already said it, participate. If you are 18, register to vote. If you are active voter, be informed so that you know what you want to choose. I'm not advocating any side, but try to be a decent human being and vote. Exercise your right. That is, at least you could do that, no matter what profession you are. So, have a seat. When you get the chance, you write the manual, because it will benefit others. So, one last secret to those who are 16 here now. 16. You do have a few. And I give you a secret. You might not think Am I 16? What can I do? Yes. In America, if you're a US citizen, you're 16 year old, you can run for board commissioner in, in your school board. So you can 
you can influence hundreds of million of the budgeting in your own district. Do you know? Wow. If not, prepare yourself and be that change. Very good. Good advice. Guys, tonight you have to work on those millions, so, okay? Um, I don't know about 16, but we have to take to check check it out. But 16 year old, you can pre-register to vote. I just went to Limbro High School, pre-registered um, 16 year old, 80 of them. You pre-register the day you turn 18, you will receive your ballot. Because 18 year olds are very preoccupied with their college applications and this and that, don't have time to register vote. So register yourself, pre-register when you're 16, 17, by 18 year old. The League of Women Voters um, are working on this. We're going school by school. We started with Limbro High School. We go to Mala Vista. We go to Homestead, Cupertino, and Fremont. And then we're going to go um, other leagues. Um, but to answer your question, actually, I believe in your generation, you actually are being exposed too much. Too much internet, too much outside influence. Everybody else looks prettier because they only put the best part in the website or Instagram. Everybody sounds better than you. You know, everybody is, it you, you, doesn't matter how thin you are, everybody is somebody else's singer. How good a tennis player you are, somebody else is always better. So it's always not enough. In your life, everything's not enough. You, uh, your parents are anxious too. They feel that the number one, I ask parents, the number one fear they have, they tell me is, have I given myself, my kids, enough activities? Did I give them enough opportunity to, to succeed? So my advice for your generation is sit back, relax. You are unique in your own way. Do what you love to do and do well. You don't have to be good in math, English, biology, um, violin, piano, um, cricket, whatever. Do something, pick something you love and learn deep. You love math, learn deep. You love tennis, learn deep. You love dance, learn deep and enjoy it. And you will be fine. Be, but be, if you keep on looking at what other people are better than I am, and then it's never enough, then your world, you're growing up in a, in a way that you're not satisfied with yourself. Then you feel this, this inadequacy in your heart. So I'm gonna tell you a true story. One of my Vedadara staff, she is excellent. You know, leadership, um, yearbook, you know, everything, sports. But a teacher, one of the class teacher told the class, write an article about me. You know, describe yourself, me. She couldn't describe herself. She went to the teacher and said, let me, back, she begged, said, let me describe you or, or this person or that person or my friend or this, but I can't describe myself, so I don't know who I am. I um, look at her and said, you are excellent in everything you do. You participate in so many activities. And she was one of my best veterinary staff. But she said, I don't know who I am. I just go from one class to another, one activity to another, and I don't know who I am. So find yourself. Find who you are. And no matter where you are, what you do, people who love you will truly love you. They really don't care whether you're a social worker, you're not a lawyer, or you, um, you know, you're working McDonald's, you're not a um, CEO, because they love you. And it, so find yourself. And I know you guys are busy, but I'm not saying that fail. I mean, I'm saying try. And it's good to fail. If you never fail, you never be disappointed. I am disappointed I wasn't elected, but I'm not discouraged. I tell you what my mother said. My mother, as her mother, as a mother's pride, she said, my daughter has 7,116 fans out there who voted for her, even though I wasn't elected, you know. But she said, I'm so proud of you. 7,116 people voted for you. Yes, yes. I look at her and said, oh, that's a great way to look at life, you know. And then the last thing I want to tell you is, we always say, we only live once, right? We want to do good because we only live once. But I read it somewhere, it's, this guy said, no, 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 you're wrong. We only die once. We live every day. So now every day before I go to bed, I pretend I'm dead. When I wake up next morning, I say, wow, I got another day to give, another day. So we only die once, but we live every day. That one, one I want to teach you. Thank you.
Sure. You know, when you said um, your, your life is very busy and you don't have time, that's the same, you know, the thing, every, everybody in Silicon Valley is go through the same, not only 60, even 60 year old also. But if you want to help others, if you want to give back, definitely you will find a way. If there is a will, there is a way. And um, there are several even adult volunteers, they are so busy, they come up to me and say they don't have time to do this, they can't do this. We have volunteers who, you know, who are going to school and they are not aged, reach the age to come to the shelter. So they find many ways to do it. I'll give you one of them which could help. If you are good in math, you are good in English, there are several underprivileged homeless shelter families, they are struggling to find, go to a tuition. They don't have money to go to tuition. You can go teach those kids. They are available on weekends. You can go spend half an hour, one hour with them and you can uh, teach them. So you can find a number of ways if you want to help others or if you want to give back. Time should not be an obstacle that one cannot find time to help others. There is no 25th hour in the day. Yes. Only 24. This has been incredible. The three of you are so inspirational and clearly role models in your communities and that's what's gonna lead me to the question that I have for, for each of you. And it's a two-part question, so bear with me for a second. I hear so often that, oh, I don't matter, I don't make a difference. The one person not making a difference when, you know, we all know stories of, you know, election being won by one, you know, by the one vote. But the one person not making a difference, and extend that to the corporations here in Silicon Valley. We have some of the wealthiest corporations imaginable. And without naming names, we also have some of the least socially responsible corporations in the Valley. So my two-part question is, how do you overcome uh, people who think they're not important and they don't make a difference? And how do you overcome the only thing that matters is high tech to the high tech community? I think I can understand um, your question. So we live in a world that um, money is very important, right? Um, and the high-tech company, they have obligations to their shareholders and their employees. So a lot of them, it's a company. It's not really a person. This company is made of board of directors, made of CEOs. So again, like Anthony says, it's all about building relationships. So as a um, vice president of the Fremont Union High School's foundation, my job right now is to go and build relationships with high-tech companies in Silicon Valley, um, uh, Fremont Union High School District covers all the whole Sunnyvale, Cupertino, part of San Jose, part of Santa Clara, part of Saratoga, and part of Los Altos. My job is go and work out relationship with these companies. And I'm all about raising each other up. What do they need that we can offer them so that they can offer to our students? We offer them the next generation. We offer them the next generation that can make their company or break their company. Right? So what they can help us is raise the next generation that's going to save the earth or work with their company. So what I, I'm starting to offer them is what we can do for you, well, what you can do for us. I believe in raising each other up. If it's just me, 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 nobody's really going to um, you know, help you. So it's all about what can we do to help each other to raise each other up. And I always say if a company makes money, they like Apple computer, they got, I don't know how many billions of dollars and they're the best, biggest company, but because they take risk. They, one time Apple was almost done, right? And Steve one. Jobs saved it. So they took risk and Steve Jobs was one of my idols. He was not the most philanthropic person. Yes. He believed in personal talent. He believed in hard work. He believed, and these are all the things we want to teach our kids. So what can we offer high tech company so that they would invest in the community, invest in the community that they live. Build more homes means their employees don't have to travel so much. Uh, you know, um, 
raise the next generation means they can have a next generation to work for them. So find out that sweet spot, like you said. Find out that relationship building. Then you can get them to open their eyes and see things. But first, we have to be able to offer. Because once we offer what we have, they can see the value. Then we can help each other raise each other. So uh, that, that would be my strategy to how to reach out into the companies that have the assets, they have the uh, ability, but they don't have to do it. You know, they, they, their main responsibility is to their shareholders and to, to, to survive because they will have downturns. They have to wait for the downturns. They take risk and they have to, you know, assess what their risks are. But I believe we can offer them um, good products in return, whether it's human resources or, or it's um, um, business resources. That's when we can help each other. And I'm trying to find that sweet spot, and I'm working on it. But let me help you with that. Let me answer that. Um, Milton Friedman, the economist, wrote a lot about it. And one of the things that he said, and I'm not quoting him by any means, is that although at first they think it doesn't a add to their bottom line, the very fact that they are socially aware and socially responsible increases not only their reputation, but the morale and therefore the productivity of their people. So there's, there's really direct value that, that can be measured in giving back and being community active. And, and I do look at it in a very practical, holistic way because if their employees live in the community that their company is, then there's more personal investment in there. So I'm looking at how can we as a community work together and have the employees who work in our com com community live in our community so that they can eat, drink, shop, and invest in the community. So I think that's a win-win situation where uh, we have to create in Silicon Valley. And so um, I'm hoping that politically or um, locally, we have the will to do it. You know, we have encountered working with um, organizations who are very wealthy, as you said, and some are even wealthy, but they don't want to. But that's only in terms of donating the money. You know, there are a lot of organizations when, uh, when, when you donate, they match too. Yes. They match some of them, especially Apple, one is to two, they're matching. But what we are looking at is, you know, the building the relationship and go and we are using our, uh, they, the volunteers or the ambassadors of those organizations to go and talk about and spread what they have done, how their experience was last weekend cooking at the shelter. So even if the wealthiest organizations are not supporting financially, but they are allowing their employees to come as a group. And if, if you see every month, third Saturday. It's team building for them. Yes, yeah, team building. Team building, act right, right word. team building activities outside the premises. So we have several companies, tech companies, and you know, non-tech companies, financial companies. They have, uh, they have come and participated. So you know, we are very blessed in Silicon Valley especially and um, not only any Indian community, and we have every very ethnicity who have supported us in a big way, and I cannot thank them enough. Otherwise, Community Seva would not be here where it is today. Great. I think, I think go ahead, add your comments before we, uh, concluding comments, I would say. Okay, um, it, it just, for that question, in fact, a lot of you can do something Link the dot together. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. I don't name the name of the company, so I don't advertise them. Uh, a place uh, so poor that don't even have electricity. And there is a, so, I mean, uh, a panel to generate from solar, solar panel. To them, maybe a few thousand dollars. But what we do is like, we find a couple of electrical engineer, mechanical engineers. They only take maybe two week vacation. And then the solar panel company, we, we ask for a couple of free panel, ship it to certain area that need it. And that group of engineer took a vacation, a free vacation. And in two weeks, they set up a project that they could, using whatever is natural, the sunlight, store the power into those uh, charged battery, like car battery, and suddenly those couple of people can rent the battery 
for night business for electricity. Just in that way, they survive 150 people's orphanage just by doing that, linking them. So a lot of you can think of linking something together. In America in particular, we throw a lot of things, we waste a lot of things. Yeah. Imagine in this city, all the whole food or grocery store, by law they throw away those almost expired food because they rather to waste it than being sued. Imagine if you have a trucking company and a group of volunteers. Every time before they throw away three days' food, ship it directly to the food kitchen and cook it. And maybe to your kitchen too. Yeah. Cook it, then you have a constant surprise. We don't waste the food. We help those grocery store to make good of whatever they're going to lose. Just an example, you can think of many, many of this so that you can help out too. Yes, uh, you're right, because I have a friend who goes to La Boulanger and he picks up bread from them every day in the late in the evening and then goes and gives it to the homeless, hungry people. You and Mr. Patino, the, yeah. the West Valley Community Center, yeah. they do the same thing. They go pick up what you write in the previous day's night. Yeah. Oh wow! Imagine, and uh, they come. They can come. Just pick up any grocery they want and go. No questions asked. So you touched upon the social responsibility of corporations. Yes. So that uh, that individual social responsibility also encompasses that. Incredible, incredible role models, and you know if we could clone you and send you around to various communities to convince, <laughs> convince other people that they do count, that singular individuals do matter. Yeah, that's true. That was a very good closing remark, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. all of you. So let's give a round of applause.